Hey, welcome to Bar Z. My name is Stan. Uh, this is week update number 17. We've skipped a few weeks. And I've been playing with, uh, oh, I got a GoPro Hero 3 Plus for my birthday. Um, that was the week of Labor Day. And I've been kind of playing with it ever since. So I, uh, uh, it's been kind of a fun uh, little camera to, to mess around with. Now, uh, I got a few things we can go over for this week. Uh, a while back, I sharpened a slitting saw and I shot a small amount of video um, with the results and uh, showed the cuts and everything. So uh, here, we'll cut to that and I'll show you the shadings and everything off of that. Let's, uh, let's cut to that slitting saw real quick. And uh, I just thought I'd update you on that uh, slitting saw that I was working on. Those are the kind of chips I was getting out of it. It looked like a carpenter's uh, been in there with a chisel. Uh, chiseling out, mortising out hinges and stuff, but um, I made it through the rest of my job. And I was going to show you the these all all these little squares. They get a relief cut on the 45 side and on the 90 degree side. So there's two cuts per each one. And I'm going to try to get you down to see that finish and the slot that's in there. So it makes uh, you know, it does the slotting really nicely, and the finish down the bottom is really good. It gives me a nice square edge uh, down deep. So, uh, yeah. So I, I made it through the rest of my job, no problem. And uh, that was thanks to keening up that blade on the Spindex. Uh, just thought I'd update you guys on how it actually worked. So I got through um, all those parts there. That's uh, what? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. Um, cut on each each side, so that's thirty six cuts. So it made it through uh, all of those, and uh, those are the types of fragments you can expect out of a properly working uh, slitting saw. Alrighty, uh, real slow feed uh, for those of you that don't do slitting saw operations. Um, in back gear, I was running about 100 RPM. The slitting saw likes anywhere between 100 and 150 RPM for a 3-inch slitting saw. And uh, my feed, oh, here, I'll just I'll just show you. It was just creeping along that fast. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's about 10 thousandths per second. All right. Um, just thought I'd update you on that. Back to me. And back. Um, the next thing is my uh, slab work got finished out back and uh, I got a couple shots of it. I got my trailer parked up on it so I got a nice flat spot to uh, park the trailer now and it's, it's, it's kind of nice for loading and unloading and when you flip the back door down you can roll equipment in and out. Uh, generators, welders, plasma cutter, whatever, pipe threader, you know whatever's going in the trailer can just, just roll right up the ramp and you don't have to fight it in the dirt like you were before. Rolling stuff around the dirt sucks, but uh, yeah, here let's uh, let's cut to that, and I'll show you the slab all finished with the with the trailer and its final resting location. So nice to come out back and find a nice fat slab to stand on, walk on, work on, whatever. Still can't park anything on it. I'm waiting a few more days to park on it. I've been wetting it down twice a day, but uh, it's awfully nice to have a, a nice big slab out behind the shop. So I finally got a decent place to park my trailer. Got a nice pad to park it, and I even got a little spot for some material, which is nice. And now I can flip the back door down on the trailer and uh, roll parts uh, all the way out to the shop and get them in and out. So anything heavy, I can uh, get through. And I got a clean place to back my truck up to, or back my truck up on the pad if I feel so inclined. But, uh, yeah, pretty happy with that. And I'm back. Now, those of you that are on uh, Google Plus uh, might have seen I put up a, uh, uh, a shop uh, ADD chart. I'm not going to call it ADHD. It's just ADD. Uh, I'm, I'm not really that hyperactive. So, uh, but I do have attention deficit disorder when it comes to the shop and, and get sidetracked and figure out which way to go with some projects. I actually got 
uh, stuck with a part that I needed to make, but the part that I needed to make was on a machine that I needed to make the part. And if we think about it too much, our whole universe will implode. So let's not get into that. I'm going to give you just a still shot, and I'll pause it there. If you want to pause it and look at it a little longer, I'll hold it on screen for 10 or 12 seconds. Let's look at that. And back. I hope that helps you with your uh, shop ADHD, ADD, not H. Uh, I swung by a yard sale over the weekend and no big scores, but uh, this lady said, I, 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 you know, first thing you do when you go walk up is you ask, you got any tools? And the lady said, yeah, there's a box of tools over there in the corner of the garage. And I went over there, she said, well, there's some screwdrivers and stuff. So I went through them and it was just some junky, low dollar screwdrivers. But down the bottom, I found this. It's a it's a no-go deburring tool, and it's the telescopic version that scopes in and out, and it holds the uh, will hold your spare bits in the end, and it was loaded with bits. And uh, I pulled it out of her screwdriver drawer, and uh, I asked what she wanted for it. She said 50 cents, so I got a no-go deburring tool for 50 cents for, and she called it a screwdriver. She goes, "I'll take 50 cents for that screwdriver," and. Uh, I happily paid her and went along my merry way. So that uh, Chuck uh, opened outside screwball, his magic eight ball does really good for him, but uh, that was my big find of the day, it was just that one little Noga. Okay, uh, let's see, where are, we, where are we at here? Oh, up on the board, you probably notice it says, we've always done it like that. Well, I ran into a, uh, a I was working with an older gentleman that actually works for another company, but he was assigned to me uh, during the course of this job and he was hooking up some airflow switches. I'm not going to call it the wrong way, but it certainly wasn't my way. Um, and it, I know it's a known problem. Um, he was running the air sensor tubing on some airflow switches and typically what we, what we don't want to do is a, if you've got a blower or a fan in a duct line, you've got a, a pressure sensor above and below, so it senses vacuum on the low side and pressure on the high side. Now when we face them each, towards each other like that, the upper one sees a pulse of air because it's within a few inches of, a, of an actual propeller fan blade, so it sees a pulse. So you get a bouncing airflow switch. And this was on an oven, and this is a known issue uh, when moving hot air out of an oven. Uh, they work fine when they're cold, but when the oven comes up on temp, uh, those pulses uh, get greater and greater, and you'll actually bounce the diaphragm inside the airflow switch, and uh, all it takes is just a millisecond of a dropout on that airflow switch, and uh, you, you've lost your, uh, uh, your, your, inter your running interlock circuit, and the burner has to go through, it's pre-purge and all that. And it, it's a big issue. You don't want to drop out an airflow switch ever, ever, ever. And I, and I said, well, why are you doing it that way? We, we already know that that doesn't work. And he goes, yeah, I know, but you can adjust it later. But we've always done it like that. And I hate, hate that excuse that we've always done it like that. And I've got a story here about we've always done it like that. Uh, the United States railroad gauge distance between the rails is four feet, eight and a half inches. Now that's an exceedingly odd number. Uh, why is that gauge used? <sighs> because that's the way they were built in England. And the English forefathers actually built all the early US railroads. Well, why did the English build them like that? Because the first uh, rail lines were built by the same people that built the pre-railroad tramways. Uh, and that's the gauge they used. Well, why did they use that gauge then? Because the people that built the tramways uh, used the same jigs and tools uh, when they were building wagons, uh, which used that wheel spacing. Okay, uh, why did wagons have that wheel spacing? 
Well, if you try to use any other spacing, the wagon wheels would uh, break off in some of the old long distance roads uh, because of the spacing and the, and the wheel ruts that are already in the roads. So uh, Imperial, uh, this goes back to Imperial Rome, uh, built the first long distance roads in Europe and England for their legions, uh, and the roads have been used ever since. And they created those ruts and uh, they had to match them with uh, the wagons, otherwise they'd break the wagon wheels. Well, uh, how did they arrive at that? Well, the Roman war chariots uh, formed the initial ruts. Um, and since uh, the Imperial Rome were all alike, and everything about them, what they did was all uniform, uh, everyone either would comply with them or break their wagon wheels trying to drive in and out of the ruts that they created. Um, now, Here's a twist to the story, and this, this is the interesting part. Now, uh, when you see the space shuttle on its launch pad, there are two very large booster rockets on the side of the main fuel tank, uh, called SRBs. Um, and they were made at a factory in Utah. Uh, the engineers who designed the SRBs uh, would have preferred to make them fatter, but the SRBs had to be shipped by train from the factory to the launch site. Uh, and the railroad track from the factory to the launch site run through a tunnel in the mountains and the SRBs have to fit through that tunnel. And uh, the tunnel is slightly wider than the railroad track and the, as you know, railroad tracks are uh, the same distance as the Roman chariot wheels. So, uh, and now we have the most advanced uh, transportation system in the world that was dictated by uh, the ancient Roman Empire, which is very interesting to me, but that falls back to the point of, we've always done it like that. And I always try to get my guys to think, Aaron, this is really cliche, think outside the box. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and if you've got a better way, or you think you've got a better way, I'm always up for trying, and failing isn't really failing because you learn something. Um, you learn that's not the way to do it. So, you know, you've got a big list of ways not to do something, you can scratch that off the list and know, man, I don't even want to do that again. That sucked. So failures are a learning experience. As long as you take something away from it, always take something away from your failures. So worst excuse ever, we've always done it like that. Now here's another twist. Why did the Roman chariots have that wheel spacing? Well, they had that wheel spacing so that the wheels wouldn't drive through the horse manure of the two horses in front of them and fling horse manure up on the uh, occupants of the chariot. So now we have the rail gauge the United States rail gauge dictated by two horses' asses. All right, that's that. Uh, let's see what's up next. Um, I got, well, you saw, you guys all saw me unboxing the, uh, the Square Master. And I, I had already got, had that edited and up on the, uh, up on YouTube uh, when this showed up, actually late. Um, the other day. Uh, Randy Richards, if you don't subscribe to his channel, swing by there and say hi to him. He does some uh, pretty cool stuff. He, he just started making videos and uh, he's showing the hows and whys of building some stuff. Uh, but Randy, Randy and I have uh, exchanged a few emails back and forth and when he was building his dovetail cutters or his uh, um, tool post holders, I offered him the, the dovetail cutter that's on the tool loan program if he wanted to you know, use it to make his, uh, his tool post holders. And, uh, and then he said, no, I got some tricks up my sleeve here. Well, we're just going to go to that. I said, fine. Okay. So it, it never went out. And then, uh, later on in his vids, he, uh, he showed a, uh, a dovetail cutter that he made and very, very slyly, he made two of them, uh, which he sent to me. And if, for those of you that haven't watched that video, this, this is actually made out of a bolt. Uh, that holds a landing gear on a Sikorsky helicopter, which uh, 
I don't know what's cooler, the uh, the dovetail cutter or the fact that it used to be on a helicopter. They're both really cool. And I uh, I threw some uh, tool black on it so it would preserve it. But here I'll show you that that he sent. Uh, these are the kind of tools that uh, when you need them, you need them. And, but when you don't need them, they sit around <clears throat> for a very long time. So that's why I put tool black on it. Uh, I'm going to oil it and bag it and put it in my drawer for when, it, for when I, you know, the occasion does arise. But uh, he sent me actually a test piece too with a test cut on it. And it, uh, it looks like it performs flawlessly. So I can't wait to use it, Randy. And, and thank you very much for that. And uh, I got some squares coming to you uh, in, in exchange for that. All right. Um, what are we at now? Uh, what we've already sent out, um, I sent a couple of pairs of large squares for testing to uh, Tom Lipton. Um, and I'm holding his, his three inch squares for ransom. I, I made him another set of three inch. But uh, here, here's, uh, here's what I need to see to, to get your three inch squares out, Tom. So these just got back from uh, hardening and tempering. And this is, a, this is a sizable square. That's a nice size. And it's built the same way as the little ones, just a nice large one, a uh, nice thick web. I was actually worried about the distortion. I'll hold it up and let you kind of look down there. Let's see if I can line that up with the lens so you can get a look down there. So it stayed pretty straight. And they're all uh, um, straight enough to get uh, to get ground. You know, if they're a few thousand soft, we, we grind them straight. Uh, same thing on the big ones here. I was especially worried about that long side there. It's got a little bit of a sweep to it, but I think I can grind that out. So uh, 6030s in a large size and 9045s in a large size. Uh, these two uh, I was going to send to uh, uh, my buddy Tom Lipton for his uh, uh, use and see if he hates them, loves them, whatever. And I actually needed to send him a pair of 3-inch uh, to replace the ones that he already has, but he says he likes having my early prototypes with known defects and that as a ransom to Tom Lipton until I see a video doing this. As soon as I see that, uh, you got your new squares coming at you, Tom. And back, and uh, if you don't show me a video of you snapping that uh, um, little squares in half, you're not getting your three inch. But I did go ahead and send your biggins. Uh, also, got some going out to Brad over at Tactical Keychains. Uh, we exchanged for some of his uh, pens and magnets and stuff. And by the way, your magnets are really cool, Brad. I use them on the surface plate to hold little parts to the sign bar. Uh, very nice. Um, Next up, and this is probably my last topic of the week, um, I, this year I will not be going to the SEMA show, and it's going to be the first time in a long time that I, I, uh, I usually at least attend and, and just go to the show for a couple of days. Uh, best time we had was, um, I think it was 06 or 07 uh, SEMA show. We had... There was three shows in town that week, and we attended two of them, and we got to see the aftermath of one of them. Uh, it was the SEMA show at the Las Vegas Convention Center. It was the NACE show at uh, Mandalay Bay, and we attended both and were there for the full time, and the two shows just ran back to back, and uh, the SEMA was a full five days, and then as soon as SEMA quit, NACE started. And I didn't have a booth at either one, but I was, and I was able to attend. But, uh, and then that same week, the National Porn Convention was in town. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Vegas was, that was a crazy week. I was there for nine days, and uh, what a great time we had. That was probably the best year ever. Um, but I won't be attending this year. I'm not going to go as a spectator, and I'm certainly not going to show. Um, the one year I did buy a booth, uh, I'm not going to tell you how much it was, but it was uh, astronomically expensive to uh, set up a display 
at the SEMA show. Um, I had just got my Department of Transportation approval on uh, my air hitch. Some, some of you may know, and now a lot of you, a lot more of you do know, um, that I was uh, selling and manufacturing um, air hitches. And here, I got some still photographs and a little bit of video. Here's, uh, here's some of it. And back and that that hitch just uses a uh, Firestone airbag and it uh, takes a shock out of uh, the truck and trailer um, between the truck and trailer and it, it really starts to shine at about uh, 800 you know 800 or 1,000 pounds of tongue load that's when that uh, air hitch really uh, starts to hold its own anything less than that it really doesn't you know, really don't feel any difference but uh, uh, the heavy tongue loads on the trailers really uh, um, can really toss your truck around, and with the with the cargo glide, you don't even feel it. But uh, um, that's it. And I, I'm still making them. You know, we make maybe three or four a year. But that was my big uh, uh, retire early scheme that didn't work out. Uh, I think after the the SEMA show, I think I sold uh, so I don't know ten or twelve of them. That's all that ever became of it. So. Big money sink. All right, guys, I want you guys to have a good weekend. Uh, this is going to publish uh, probably late Friday. And um, have a good weekend and enjoy your week next week. Uh, stay safe, and thanks for watching. Bye now.